Welcome to EAU TV. We are in Madrid for the EAU 2025 conference. My name is Elena Castro. I'm a medical oncologist from Madrid and I had the pleasure to chair a session this morning about uh, perioperative biomarkers for GU tumors and some of the speakers are with me here. I'm I'm together with uh, Dr. Sfakianos from New York and Dr. Glyph from Vancouver. And uh, I'm going to ask them to very briefly summarize their presentations today. Dr. Glyph? Sure. I was asked to speak on a topic uh, uh, um, summarizing the current state of neoadjuvant strategies in prostate cancer, clearly something that's been studied for decades. Um, and unlike in radiation therapy, where it's an established standard of care, neoadjuvant or perioperative systemic therapies for localized prostate cancer have not uh, uh, identified a regimen that has become a standard of care. Uh, despite having many therapies that are active and life prolonging in advanced disease, when they're applied to the high risk localized state, um, uh, while responses are oftentimes deep, uh, we rarely see complete responses and we have yet to see a meaningful improvement in something that is clinically relevant, such as uh, uh, metastasis free uh, recurrences. Um, there is, however, a uh, important global trial now that is just maturing, uh, that has matured, uh, completed, and we're waiting for events called Proteus, 1,500 patients uh, treated with standard uh, one-year LHRH alone, with or without apalutamide, and the primary endpoint there, uh, in addition to metastasis-free recurrence, is uh, depth of pathologic response. So that will not only hopefully provide us with a new regimen to apply to people with high-risk localized uh, prostate cancer around surgery, but also give insights into uh, surrogacy of depth of response as a uh, future um, uh, biomarker to help us in this space. In the meantime, the field is very busy with many uh, biomarker-driven studies uh, trying to segment heterogeneity into smaller baskets that are potentially exploitable by various systemic therapies. Um, many of these are one-offs where you have a single therapy like a PARP inhibitor uh, or a PSMA lutetium study or say an AKT inhibitor, but you have to screen many people in order to identify those rare um, or uncommon phenotypes. So it's inefficient from a screening perspective. Um, we designed a trial to help to capture all these called an umbrella trial called the genomic umbrella neoadjuvant study where all men with high risk localized prostate cancer uh, enter into the protocol. Uh, get, they get treated for eight weeks of standard master protocol therapy, LHRH uh, uh, plus apalutamide. Uh, once their biopsies have been sequenced, based upon what alterations they have, they're then assigned to one of four sub-protocols, genomically favorable, just ARPI intensification, um, a, uh, a tumor suppressor loss, an aggressive phenotype we know doesn't respond as well to ARPIs, get added a dose of taxol chemotherapy. If your HRR altered, you add a PARP inhibitor, niraparib, or if your MSH2 altered high TMB, uh, you get uh, um, a tezolutamide. So that's one example of a, a umbrella trial where we then treat for a total of six months, take out the prostate and measure depth of response as a way to understand um, uh, um, improved combination activity. But more importantly, we get tissues pre and post to allow us to do extensive um, bulk sequencing and in addition, spatial profiling to better mm -hmm. understand emergent resistance in cancers that are treated in a precision oncology framework. Um, finally, it's an adaptive trial, which means that as trials close, as some protocols close and new drugs become available, we can open new protocols. This year, we're opening two new protocols, one using uh, an EZH2 inhibitor, Tasmetastat, 
in patients that are potentially plastic in terms of their response to ADT, mainly P53 altered uh, or MYC amplified, mm -hmm. et cetera. And then a, another sub-protocol uh, prone to AKT inhibition, mainly those that are P10 deficient, AKT gained. Uh, and so that's, again, a protocol that, uh, a, uh, a trial that hopefully will uh, inform us on which combinations may then be applicable to study in patients with more advanced disease. And actually, I think this is a very pragmatic design that makes all the sense because otherwise we, that we, we have data from neoadjuvant uh, uh, approaches, but without differentiating, we now understand that the biology of prostate cancer is very different in one case uh, to another. And it, I personally think it makes all the sense actually yeah. to, to the, the, the approach of the umbrella uh, study. And we have a fantastic uh, talk on the, on the role of ctDNA in, in bladder cancer. Could you summarize it for us? Yeah, thank you. Um, so yeah, the, the talk was really to focus on the use of ctDNA as a biomarker in the perioperative setting. Um, we're actually pretty much from the beginning of diagnosis for patients with bladder cancers. So uh, we've been using the TRBT specimen um, for uh, patients and using that as a tumor specific uh, ctDNA. So it gets sequenced. Um, so it is very specific to that primary tumor. Um, and then looked at the role of se sequential sample collection mm -hmm. from the TRBT on, as well as just single time points and how those could be relevant and how we can treat patients with bladder cancer. I think we all as urologists who treat bladder cancer, medical oncologists who treat bladder cancer, we understand that there's a huge heterogeneity uh, even within the TNM staging, we have these very advanced cancers that we're like, oh, this patient's not going to do well. And miraculously, 10 years later, the patient's with us. And then we have these small tumors uh, that we just are a lot more advanced than we think that they are, that we would call clinically T2 disease. So I think adding the ctDNA early on now is allowing us to better risk stratify the patients, adding in a, a genomic component that we have previously tried to use sequencing, you know, and and RNA subtyping, but didn't really pan out as well as we thought it would. But I think ctDNA at this point is now a more promising biomarker to help us. Um, a few of the findings that we have are that, you know, that single time point, <coughs> ctDNA I think is very important. So if you're undetectable um, at the time of diagnosis, uh, those are the patients that do the best. Mm -hmm. um, I think those are the patients that we can now actually speak about de-escalation of care. Um, in my opinion, I think those are the patients that probably don't need neoadjuvant chemotherapy, and that's what our data shows, that if you're undetectable, um, you do just as well with surgery alone versus neoadjuvant chemotherapy uh, followed by surgery. If you are positive, um, I think that's where we need to do escalation of care um, because those patients... Um, are really the, the bad players, if we can use that, uh, that terminology. Um, so now this is allowing us to sub, further substratify our patients and, mm -hmm. and make treatment recommendations. Um, and interestingly, in our um, work and, and others, it's really 50-50, believe it or not. So about 50% <coughs> of the patients at time of diagnosis are CDT, ctDNA undetectable, mm -hmm. and 50% of the patients awesome. are detectable. Um, and so now we can um, you know, better identify those patients. A few of the other uh, important findings, it's um, that those, there, there are a subset of patients, like I said before, that have very advanced disease, node positive, T3 disease, that actually have undetectable ctDNA. And so that really is now going into the biology of the disease. We always knew that there were some patients that had more um, lymphatic spread, others locally advanced, and those that were more hematogenous spread. Um, so now I think we're being able to pick up those more lymphatic, locally advanced patients that maybe are curative if we do do uh, a radical surgery for those patients. I think it's also not an absolute detectable or undetectable. We show data that a, a cutoff of about 2.5 um, MTMs per ml or molecule mutations per ml um, really stratifies the patients that, that are going to do well versus those who are not going to do well. Um, and lastly, which I think is for me very important, not only for the urologist, but also for the medical oncologist, is that we were able to show that undetectable ctDNA has a 100% sensitivity to uh, normal imaging. So for those patients who are getting surveillance imaging, 
um, with CAT scans, MRIs, or whatever it may be, um, we may be able to substitute that with a blood draw. Um, and at least in the United States, and the way we're able to do this, the blood draw can actually be done at home. So patients don't have to travel. Oh. They don't have to come in for their visits. A phlebotomist goes to their home, they get the blood drawn, we get the result, and then we can make a decision if we need to see them or if they need further, uh, further testing and so on. So I think there's multiple areas uh, that CTDNA could be impactful and can help us risk stratify patients and now make better treatment decisions. And I think for clinical trials, it's essential. Um, yeah. I mean, I think that's gonna be the most important part is getting this used in the clinical trial setting to help us really uh, validate where it's best used in the patient care. And you just uh, uh, told us about is quantifying CTDNA, but what about profiling the, the CTDNA for bladder? Is this something that will have to be done at several times during the disease or can we just do it once? Yeah, so far what, we, what we've been able to, to show is that all you need is a TRBT specimen mm -hmm. and the bioinformatics pipeline that, at least for Natera, which is what we use in their test Signatera, has the ability to pick up clonal mutations. Um, so from that single time point, um, you, that's all you really need for the life of the patient. Um, and they will pick up the metastases and then um, it actually continues picking up uh, the tumor even after resistance to systemic therapies where you know we would expect other mutations to be picked up mm -hmm. um, but from the initial uh, tumor they identify 16 or 17 uh, clonal mutations and then that way there is a, a large variety that can be can be followed yeah i think you can I ask you a question and sure. that you know so speaking of clonal evolution not just which is time driven right and, and associated with re-expansion but under selective pressures of treatment we see uh, obviously s different subpopulations emerge right. uh, and progress, but is the uh, is it they're not detecting it because they're using the same template that they originally designed on the basis of their needle bot uh, on the basis of the TRBT, mm -hmm. and that allows them to be very sensitive and specific. And so you're not detecting new alterations in part because they're not uh, doing more of a, uh, a whole exome sequencing. They're just going after a, a very defined template approach. Um, so the initial is whole exome. Yeah. Um, I know Lars Driscott at Aarhus is using whole yeah. genome now. Mm -hmm. um, but I think from that initial um, analysis, that deep dive, you're, you're identifying 16 or 17 mm -hmm. alterations that don't get lost. Mm -hmm. So even if they pick up new alterations because of pressures uh, resistance or, or temporal, um, you, you still have those initial ones so you can continue picking up the metastases. You won't be able to use it per se for targeted therapy. So you know you, you won't know if an FGFR3 uh, emerges. mutation is emerges over yeah. time to use an FGFR3 inhibitor, but you will continue picking up the metastases with a single initial analysis. Okay, so that's probably a limitation of, of, of that analysis. In prostate, we see, what we see is that during the evolution, the tumor usually acquires uh, new alterations, is perhaps more heterogeneous, mm -hmm. and we might need to repeat the analysis. I mean, the difference in, in prostate is that we um, cannot detect ctDNA um, in patients who do not have overt metastasis. Mm -hmm. So even high risk, high volume localized disease, and we've looked at this, uh, we can't uh, improve the sensitivity to detect, in part because we don't have the same, I think, um, uh, a need to do so because right. we have a PSA. PSA. Now, I, I would, uh, you know, if we sequence a cancer, find a specific mutation in P53, you could probably go and design a very deep sequencing approach to see whether that, that MET exists, but it, the unmet need isn't there because we have PSA. Right. But I think where uh, CTDNA helps in prostate is to track clonal evolution under the selective pressures of AR pathway inhibition, where obviously the most relevant emergent subpopulation are those that are AR altered, you know, mm -hmm. copy number gains, they can bind in domain um, uh, uh, mutations, uh, splice variants, you know, drive that process. But we also see an emergence of other pathways that weren't present in the 
fast rate sensitive space and are potentially biologically relevant in terms of driving resistance and maybe actually therapeutically relevant in terms of selecting new uh, new therapy. So I think it, the, it is necessary in prostate to um, uh, keep the uh, exon, uh, the, the sequencing relatively uh, open agnostic to detecting new emergent alterations. Dr. Spakianos, Dr. Glib, thank you so much for uh, being here with me today. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed the discussion as much as I did.